Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we have a wonderful presentation lined up for today from the Money Museum, um, and we're really excited about that, but I just wanted to welcome everyone today. Uh, we are in webinar mode, so I believe you'll be able to ask questions through chat, um, and then maybe uh, we can uh, figure out how we're going to go ahead and um, pose those to our presenters. Um, if you want to cover that in your intro, that would be great. Uh, before we get started, I just want to let everybody know that we're going to have a really cool program uh, in a couple of weeks on the 20, on the 26th, and that's with our special collections people at Pikes Peak Library District, and we're actually going to dig into our digital photo collection. So um, if you look on Library Market, that's where you can sign up and get the information. Uh, and please uh, think about doing a science project for this year. We're having our science fair virtually, um, and we're going to be able to have you submit either a video or a photo of what you worked on with a short description. Um, and that's going to open up on February 5th. So if you want to uh, make sure you get your science fair dose this year, um, please look on Library Market as well. And I'll, I'm going to follow up with an email um, with links to those for you. Um, so we're really excited for our virtual tour today. I know we're going to learn a lot, and um, I think we're ready to get started. So um, if you want to take it away, Doug. Hello, welcome to the A&A's Money Museum. Today, we're going to learn about money, what it is, its history, and how coins are made. We will start in our traditional money area, where we show examples of all sorts of early money from all over the world back in the days when money was very different from what it is today. But first, that brings up the question, what is money? Most of us think of our own American money, coins and paper, like the quarters and dollar bills, which are in our pockets, that we can use at the 7-Eleven and buy things with. But money was not always like that. Before coins and paper were invented, people used all sorts of things for, for money, from, from feathers to cows to shells and even rocks. Uh, the important thing was that they all agreed that they had value. Now, thousands of years ago, when, when, our, when people began to start trading things, uh, they started trading for things that they had for things that they needed. Now, an example of this is the barter system. And wh what would happen is if you're a farmer and you had wheat, for example, and you needed a pot, you would go to a pot maker and trade your wheat for the pot. As long as you agreed on the price, everybody was happy and you'd move on and everything worked out. The problem is, what do you do if a pot maker doesn't want your wheat? Maybe they want an ax. So maybe you can go to an ax maker and trade your wheat for an ax, and then go to the potter and trade your ax for their pot. Well, that works if everybody knows each other and they trust each other and they all have an agreement on the basic value. But if you don't, you need to figure out some way to, to decide how much is a pot worth? How much is wheat worth? How do you compare them? This is the kind of thing that becomes a real problem the further away you get from people when you don't know your neighbors and things like that. This is where money becomes really important. So with that, let's go back to our question. What is money? Well, money is whatever people accept as a means of payment for goods or services. So this means that, say, we go to 7-Eleven, we can use our dollar bill to buy a soda. Everybody accepts that a dollar bill is worth a dollar and that a soda is worth a dollar. So we can exchange the two because they've got it priced. Money is also a means to measure the value of things relative to, relative to each other. So in, in a situation like that, money allows you to decide, well, a car is worth $30,000. A house is worth $150,000. You can tell immediately that if the car is worth $30,000, well, you need five cars to equal one house at $150,000. That's, that's a really important aspect of money because it does allow you to compare things so that it makes trade easier, especially when people don't know each other. Um, money is also a means of storing and accumulating wealth. This is an important idea because you don't have to use it immediately. It's something you can keep, and at some later date, you can actually use it to buy things. This is where things like banking become important because it's a place where we can keep our money. And with banking, we have interest earnings. So when you store your money, you can actually make more money 
just because you're saving it. Well, with that, it's time to move on to our early examples of traditional money. We're going to start in our Asia and Oceania case. This is basically the area that covers the Pacific Ocean and all of Asia from, from China to the Middle East. They used money of different sorts based on what was available and what people were used to using over time. The first thing we start with is a whale tooth. Now this is a sperm whale tooth. It comes from the South Pacific. These teeth were used as money because they had value based on how hard it was to get them. Getting a, whale t a whale's tooth when you're in an open canoe and using spears is very difficult. It's a very dangerous job. So once you had that tooth, it represented value. It showed the bravery and resourcefulness of the, of the hunter. And for that reason, they became valuable and they were used in trade. They were also a symbolic value. They weren't used the way we use uh, paper money or coins today. You didn't go and buy groceries with a whale tooth. What you did though, is used it as a symbol of your worth. And for example, for bride price in the South Pacific, a whale tooth could be used to give to the family of a bride so that they would accept the loss of their daughter in marriage to this other person. So they became an important type of symbolic money that represented value because of the difficulty in getting them. The next thing we have are these cowrie shells. Now cowrie shells are the small little shells about half an inch to maybe three quarters of an inch in size. You find them in the uh, Indian Ocean. So they got value in part Though they were very common, they were hard to get. You had to go uh, long distances to get them, and then people would bring shiploads back to the areas where they're used. They were primarily used in South Asia and in Africa, East Africa in particular, the shores of the Indian Ocean. Now, these were small change. So these were not symbolically very valuable, uh, but they were used to uh, buy things and make exchanges. This is the kind of thing that you might take to a store to buy food and things like this. These particular shells are interesting because they have holes in them because since they were low value, they were put on strings and you could wear them and it was easier to carry them around when they were strung. Cowrie shells became the representation for money in China, for example, where they were used for uh, almost 5,000 years. Well, because cowrie shells became identified with the idea of money, people started making uh, copies, uh, imitation cowrie shells out of bone or shell with, in one case, this is a, a gilded cowrie shell. And they started using them as symbolic money. So when somebody died, the ancient Chinese would bury them with goods. They would have their clothing, they would have furniture, all the things that they would need to live in the afterlife, sort of like what the Egyptians used to do. Well, one of the things they, they thought they would need would be money. Rather than use the actual cowrie shells, they started to make imitations and bury them with the people so that they had their own symbolic money to use in the afterlife. Now we're gonna move on to Africa. Now Africa is in the same situation. They use money in the same ways except that they used what was locally available. So the form and, and the shape and the types of things they use are a little bit different. We're gonna start here with a Katanga cross as it's known. Now a Katanga cross is a copper ingot that's cross-shaped and um, fairly large. Now Katanga is a province in what is today Congo, which was very wealthy, which is very wealthy in iron and copper. So they used these as trade for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Well, they settled on this Katanga design and it became associated with money because it was used locally to buy and sell things over longer distance. It was also used as a way of transporting things. Now, as you got further and further away from the places where people use this as money, this type of money, which is known as a commodity money, its, it's value is based on what it's made of and it's also valuable for what the uh, material it's made out of can be used for. So often what would happen is they trade this uh, 
a long distance away, and people would then take that metal and turn it into spear points by mixing it with copper to make uh, tin to make bronze or make jewelry and other things. So this is a type of money that was used as money, but was also useful because of what it could be made into. The next thing we'll talk about is this elephant uh, tail bracelet. Now these bracelets are made out of the hair from an elephant's tail. Now this is a lot like the whale money because it took a lot of effort. You know, killing a, an elephant with a spear is very hard and very dangerous. Or even if you were brave enough to go behind an elephant and pull the tails or try to cut the tail hairs off, that would be a dangerous thing as well. So these, these bracelets not only represented a form of exchange that you could buy and sell things with, but they were also a prestige item. The fact that you had one showed that you had a certain amount of bravery or somebody in your family did to be able to collect and turn this into money. Now we'll go to North America and again, the situation is very similar. You've got different types of things that are used as money. And uh, the first thing that we'll talk about are the beaver pelts. Now, beaver could be found all over the Northeast of North America, throughout most of North America. They were valuable partly because they were common enough for their pelts to be used as money, but also their pelts in themselves were valuable because they were very soft very good for making coats and hats. They were warm. So this is another sort of commodity money where there is value attached to it because of, uh, of what it was and, and the fact that you could trade it for other things, but also because you could use it. When the uh, settlers from Europe came, they became even more important because uh, in Europe, it was very fashionable to have beaver skin hats. Uh, not not like we think of, of a beaver skin hat, but a hat made out of beaver fur. These were very fashionable for 200 years. And so beaver uh, pelts became much more valuable than they had been previously among the Native Americans. Uh, the next thing we have is another example of a sort of commodity, but it's a little different. It's a, a flint blank. Now, a blank made out of flint means that it's a piece of flint that's been prepared to be turned into a tool. Back in the days before metal was discovered and metalworking, uh, people used to use stone tools. You, you've heard of the Stone Age. Well, flint is a, is a type of stone that's found all over the world, but every place where you find it, the, the flint is a little bit different. So you can identify where a specific piece of flint comes from. This is how we know it was used as money. This particular piece was turned into a blank, so it's ready to be used. You can actually see where it was chipped and formed into this rectangle, but instead of making into a final product like a spear point or an arrowhead or perhaps a knife or a scraper, it was used in trade until it got to the final end uh, user who would then turn it into whatever they needed at that moment. So these things were very important in trade for many, many years because the, the sharpness of these things, the usefulness for tools and, and weapons, was so great. In fact, uh, a flint knife today is sharper than many of the surgical tools you'll see surgeons use. The biggest problem is it's harder to make and the, the blades are very brittle. So we don't use them very often today. There are some specialized things where they need very sharp items where they use flint even now. Well, now that we've talked about the early money of the, of the world, we're gonna move on to our next section. But before we do that, uh, I'd like to answer a few questions. Uh, pl please use the chat uh, feature of your uh, Zoom so that we can, so I can read these questions and try to answer them for you. No, uh, somebody's asking if there will be any questions on Irish money. No, there there won't be. This is a very general introduction of what, basically, what money is, and so we're not going to go into the specifics of different types of money from different parts of the world. That is something that we do have. Uh, in our exhibit, the history of money that we're in right now, but uh, it's this is much more general, so it's, it's not going to be very specific. What was this turtle-shaped currency? That actually was was not a piece of currency. It was actually used as a weight to weigh money, and that'll be part. Of, that actually runs into the next section where we're going to talk about what it takes to make money as we know of it today. 
it's what so this it was actually a weight that was designed for a specific weight so i i don't remember what the weight is it's but it, it would be equivalent to a pound and people would use that as a standard so that everybody knew what a pound would weigh different uh, parts of the world used symbolic uh items like chickens or or a turtle as a way to determine weight why did people use flint as money well people use flint as money because flint was valuable in its in a, of itself it was also relatively rare uh flint mines aren't all over the place you can't find it everywhere and so often flint would be traded hundreds or even thousands of miles away from its place of origin because there are different grades of flint and because it's relative rarity, it took on value. And then they would use that as a standard for trade over time. Uh, there are certain things where flint knives in certain types of uh, surgery, there are, there are some surgeons, not in your traditional hospital for experimental type things. There are some, some surgeons that consider a flint uh, blade to be sharper and better for certain types of studies when they're dissecting things. Uh, people did not use gold as money as we think of it. Uh, gold really started to be used as money once money as we think of it was invented. They did use it to some extent, but it didn't, it was basically, it wasn't useful as a tool it was useful as uh, decoration. It wasn't until somebody came up with the idea of coinage that gold really took, uh, took off and, and became what we think of it as today. So with that, I think I'll answer one more question and we'll go on to the next section. Were any other pelts used besides beaver for currency? Yes, absolutely. Uh, beavers were a popular thing in North America, mainly because of the European settlers and the demand for beaver pelts for hats and fashion. Uh, but there were other pelts that were used as well. Uh, depending on where you were, muskrats would be used as a quote unquote form of small change. Uh, rabbit, uh, deer, not so much. Bear, bear pelts were definitely used because they were valuable as a material for coats and things like that. So they had a higher value. Um, but yes, other types of uh, furs or pelts were used and if you look in the early colonial uh, newspapers and, and bulletins, you can find price lists where they say one beaver is worth uh, one shilling or that kind of thing um, so that the colonials especially could get an idea of what everything was worth relative to, to each other. So with that, I'll start talking about the, what's necessary in order to create money. The, the real precursor for money is the idea of having scales and measures. You have to have a system where you can compare things to each other. Uh, and before money, you didn't have that. So you, they, when scales were invented, these, this is a system where you could weigh things. And then somebody created a standard so that everybody knew that a pound was X amount of weight or half a pound and all that. You could start to compare different things and decide how much they were worth or how much you were trading. That also goes for measures for say a gallon of milk. So you knew what a gallon was or a bushel of wheat. That way you could start comparing things and determining value. Once you have that, then the stage is set for money. Now, one of the things that people discovered early on is the idea that metal would make a good form of money. And the reason for that is because metal is a relatively, um, well, it's relatively value, valuable. It comes in a compact form and a small amount of gold or silver or copper are worth relatively a lot of money because of the, of the work and effort it took, especially early on to mine them get the technology to smelt them. That's high technology. The, the being able to melt the ore and turn it into a metal was not easy to do early on. Well, that high value meant that a small amount of metal could be used to buy things, which made them ideal for trade. And using gold or silver was a good way to do that because 
gold or silver uh, didn't have a whole lot of other use other than as decoration, but as money, they were relatively rare, but still common enough so that you could have enough to use. Well, so that was one of the reasons. Also, metal was easily worked. You could hammer it, you could change its shape, you could change it into other things relatively easily. You can't take a shell and turn it into something else. You can't subdivide a cow easily because once you've subdivided it, you, you, you better eat it. It's no longer useful as money uh, and, and so on and so forth. That's why metal became very important. You could make it into smaller portions, divide it up, determine its value by weight. So now we move on to one of the other features of metal. Since metal was used as tools, once they discovered how to produce it, you'd make axes, in this case, spades. Well, the Chinese, for example, began to use spades in trade, partly because they needed it as a tool, but they also started to re represent money. And as they became more and more used as a form of money, they got smaller and smaller and thinner and thinner to the point where, for example, these are only about five inches long. They really couldn't be used as much of a spade. They'd be barely useful. They're too thin. They'd break easily. But they became the representation of money. This is the first step towards coinage. Now, true coinage, as we think of it today, was invented in what is now Turkey in the kingdom of Lydia. Now, in Lydia, they had naturally occurring deposits of metal, uh, nuggets, basically, of, of what is known as electrum. It's a mixture of gold and silver. They started using these nuggets and melting them down or changing, the, changing them so they had an exact weight. So uh, they'd have something that's called a stator. A stator was just a weight. It was about uh, 17, 16, 17 grams. And they would produce these little pellets with a standard weight. We find them with this standard weight. So we know that they were used as a type of coin, but there's no real markings on them. So it's, you can't tell who made them or, or anything else really other than from where you find them. The next step was when the Greeks adopted this idea from the Lydians. They created what we think of today as money. They created coins for the first time. Now, these coins had a, a design that was printed on them. That design represented something. Basically, it represented who issued them and whatever they wanted you, to, you the user, to think about them. So in this case, we have a Greek coin of, from Athens. Now, Athens was a major trading city. They produced uh, one of the largest series of coins in the ancient world for well over 300 years. And what they did was they put an image of Athena, the patron goddess of Athens, on the, the front of the coin. And then on the reverse, they used Athena's avatar, the owl. Athena was the goddess of wisdom and the military arts. Well, the owl represents wisdom even today because of that association in the ancient world. So they used the owl, and then they used the, the letters, the first three letters of Athens, alpha, theta, epsilon. Now. Uh, that would tell anybody that saw these coins that they came from Athens and because Athens was a major trading city and was trusted for the quality of their money, they would accept this money and use it without any questions. Now, uh, we'll have a little discussion here of how uh, coins are made as the next step will, will be moving into our mini mint. Now, coins in the ancient world were made using a bow drill, which allowed you to use a bow and the string to, to actually drill into a die. It's a, a cylinder of metal with a flat surface that would be carved into with the design in reverse. So you would use an engraver, a drill, and then once you had the die, you would use an anvil and an upper and lower die so you can strike an impression on both sides of what would become a coin and then a large hammer and tongs in order to be able to hold uh, the planchet because often they would heat the planchet. Um, so you'd, you'd want to be able to use something to protect yourself from being burned. 
with that, let's go into how coins are made. Now, our mini mint is based on uh, the mint as it existed in 1792 when the U.S. Produced, uh, created the first mint and set up shop to start creating our own coinage. This was in Philadelphia. Now, the machines we have are modern, but they're using the same techniques that were used back then in order to produce what we use as tokens, souvenirs of our money museum. The first step is to actually melt an ingot of metal. Um, you melt it to the point where you can pour it into a mold. This mold will create an ingot that can be used to start the process of producing a coin. So in this situation, we have the mold with the ingot in it. And so I can remove this from that mold. And what I end up with is this, this strip of metal. Now this strip of metal is a little too thick and needs a little bit of working before I can actually start using it in my machinery. So to do that, what I do is I put it into my rolling mill. Now this rolling mill is basically like a pasta machine. It's got two rollers. And what it does is it squishes the metal as I roll it through. As it, as it goes through, it gets flatter and smoother and it also gets longer. Now, as I go through the process, I will continue to put the rollers closer together so that I can turn this to the right thickness that I need. Now, once I have that here, I go to the next step, which is my blanking press. Now in the blanking press, what I do is I put this strip of metal in between the, the area here so that I can use a screw, which adds extra force to press a cutting die. And when I do that, I end up making blanks. And these blanks look like this. So what I have here is just a circle of metal ready to start working with and turn into a coin. The first step of that is to go to my uh, upsetting mill or a castaing machine. Now this, this type of machine was invented in the 1500s. And what it allows me to do is prepare the coin by rolling it between two dies. What I end up with is a blank which has an upset edge, this raised edge, and also a design on the edge, which you could see in the process that we just saw. There's a, a slide with a, that uh, detail. Now I am ready to start the striking process. When the ancient Greeks invented the process of striking coins, as we think of them today, what they did was they used this hammer and two dies, an upper and a lower die. The lower one was mounted in an anvil and they would bring the, the blank that we just produced, put it between the dies and strike it with a hammer. Now this, this system was capable of producing very beautiful coins, but it was relatively slow. You can only do maybe five or six or seven or so a minute. And it took a lot of strength. As you see in the picture, the, the malleator, the hammerer, is a very strong, beefy guy. I've actually done this myself, and it takes a lot of effort to do, and it's also a little scary because if you miss, you're going to hurt yourself. The next step was to go to the screw press. Now, the screw press is the kind of press that they would have used at the U.S. Mint in 1792 in Philadelphia. Very similar to this. It's got uh, a large arm on it with weights. Those four men at the edges would be pulling that, those weights about every two seconds to push the die down where the person is sitting in the uh, pit, putting planchets in. So they could do that at a rate of 30 coins a minute, which meant that you had to have a very good rhythm if you were putting those planchets in, because otherwise you're going to get your hand stuck and get something smashed. The next step is when... The steam press was invented. Now, steam engines were invented in the late, 18, uh, late 1700s by James Watt. By the early 1800s, uh, a man named Matthew Bolton began connecting steam engines with a striking press to produce coins. These machines were capable of producing 
somewhere in the range of about 120 coins a minute, the, the, the faster ones and all that. And they were much more powerful and able to produce a much more even product than the previous things. So that was a step that was used from the, eight, the early 1800s all the way up until the early uh, mid 19, yeah, the mid 1900s. The next step was when they got into these large, either electric powered or, or different means of propulsion, hydraulic presses. Now these, here's a floor, a modern floor that has about, has six presses in it, each of which is very large and is able to produce up to 720 coins a minute. Now we've got, we've caught up with technology for how to produce coins. I'll show you how we produce coins here at our mini mint. Now I'm gonna take this planchet that I just produced, this blank, and I'm gonna put it between the dies as I lift the, the upper die up. It's now mounted on the lower die, which has the carved impression on it. And I'm going to smash the two dies together to produce a token, just like that. Now, once I do that, you'll see the detail of the, uh, just how that looks, um, just like that. And each time you do that, you produce another coin. Here, I can only produce maybe 10, 10 or so in a minute, depending on if, how prepared I am. But this is what we end up with, a souvenir of our Money of Empire exhibit showing Elizabeth the Elizabeth. These, if you get a chance, you should come down to the Money Museum because you can get one of these for free on, our, uh, on the days when we're operating our Mini Mint. Uh, it's a nice coin with a design representing the exhibit. Anyway, that's it for the demonstration of the Mini Mint. Are there any other questions at this point? Again, let's let's use the uh, chat and I will attempt to answer them. We have a leftover question from the last section. Did people use flowers as money? Interestingly, there's not a lot of evidence of using flowers because basically flowers can, uh, you know, they fall apart easily, they, they don't last very long, but Flowers did form a type of money at one point. Uh, basically, one of the very earliest uh, stock markets was based on tulip bulbs in Holland. And uh, tulips became so popular and so highly valued that uh, over a period of, of a few years, the prices of tulips went through the roof and one of the first stock market crashes on record was when this tulip market crashed and many, many people lost lots of money in, in uh, the Netherlands or the Holland tulip trade. So um, what was the most common currency before the dollar? Well, the dollar is just a, a name for a type of money. It's, it's a type of money that we use in the United States, but a lot of other countries use dollars as well. So I can't really answer that uh, unless you, if you're talking about a denomination, the, it's hard to say because previous to the dollar, we used to use uh, the most common coinage for about three centuries was the Spanish piece of eight, which was also known in England and, and America as the Spanish dollar. And that was before the, our U.S. dollar was invented. So the, the term taller is actually a word that goes back to the late uh, 1400s in Europe when, uh, when they discovered a, a huge new source of silver. And in the area of Moravia in Central Europe, they began producing what was known as the St. Joachim's taller or Joachim's taller. Eventually, the word became shortened to taller and was transferred to the Dutch as dalder and to the Swedes as daler and, and, and things like that. That became transferred to the English, and that's how we ended up with dollar as our, our standard currency term. Are there other coins to make? Uh, we actually have a, a lot of different dies that we use uh, for the mini mint, and what we've done um, is Every year we have National Coin Week and we'll produce a new die for that, that project. 
We will also produce new tokens for each of our exhibits when they come out. So we do have different designs for the, the coins here. We have different dies that are used for them. Uh, when was the earliest pressed coin made? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by pressed coin. If you're talking about stru struck coins like the with the Greeks when they used hammer and dies, the earliest uh, struck coins were produced uh, around uh, the seventh century BC. So perhaps as early as the 690s BC. Uh, no one's exactly sure, but within about 10 or 20 years of, the, of 690 BC is when they first made struck coins. Uh, did people ever use goat milk as money? Not, again, the, re the problem with, with something like goat milk, uh, it was used certainly in barter. If you, if you had goats and you had more milk than you needed, you would use it in trade. But as money, it's very hard to use because it's not very, it doesn't last very long. It's only good for a couple of days before it rots. So it doesn't act as a store of value very well. So it was, if it was used, it was only used for a very short time and, and they figured out other things to use to, to preserve your wealth and, and act as a measure of value. Were gems used for money? Um, gems certainly were used in trade and it had value. The problem with gems is that a most gems are very rare, and you and it's not like you'll find you know if you went to Namibia at the in 1900 you'd find diamonds all over the beaches and stuff like that. But diamonds are not found anywhere else in the world really easily except just you know four or five places. So gems were a little bit too rare to be used as money except perhaps where they were discovered. So as a successful long-term form of money, no, they were used in trade and they have always been a store of value. So they have some of the aspects of money. Where are we located? We are located in Colorado Springs. We are right on the campus of uh, Colorado College at the Southern End. And um, we're open from Tuesdays through Fridays from right now due to COVID, 11 to 3, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, so if you get a chance, you should come down here. We've got a lot more stories and, and uh, really cool coins and paper money and metals, all sorts of things to show. And we've already, I've already answered the skins. What other types of skins were used as money? They used basically the, the nicer skins that were more um, useful and more preferable as far as, say, rabbit skin was used for a small change. Muskrat skin could be used. Uh, bear skins because they made very warm coats. Otter pelts because of their waterproof nature, things like that. Okay, let's see. No, they did not use sand dollars as money. That's an interesting uh, idea. I, I, and I'm not sure why they didn't. Sand dollars are not found all over the world, but one of the problems with sand dollars is they're relatively delicate. So they, they break apart fairly easily. And I think that might be part of it, um, but I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I haven't seen sand dollars ever referred to as being used as money. The Money Museum is actually open right now. We are already open. We will be open in the summer. And hopefully, once uh, the vaccines go out and all that stuff, we'll be open back at our regular schedule, which will be Tuesday through Saturday, basically 10 to 5, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, and when we do do that, uh, keep a lookout on our website because once we're able to open more fully, we have a free, what was a free Saturday once a month where we had programs like our kids zone, which is a lot of fun. If you, if you have kids that are under 15, we have programs that allow them to learn more about money and do a lot of fun things. Um, but for right now, you have to check the, the website to be able to make sure uh, what our schedule is. The website is www.money.org. And, uh, you should be able to find that. 
if you check the website out, there's a lot of great material on there. We have a lot of educational programming. Uh, there's quizzes, there's puzzles. There's all sorts of things you can do in our education section, which is under uh, discover or um, more information. We also have a money museum section where you can see uh, virtual tours of the whole museum. So you'll be able to see all the things we've seen and also a lot more by walking through your computer and see all of the cases and see amazing coins and, and pieces of money. Uh, it's a lot of fun. So if you get a chance, definitely visit www.money.org. Did people ever get their fingers smashed in the old fashioned printing press? Yes, they did. Uh, one of, the, as I said, they could produce up to uh, two coins uh, every second. I mean, 30 coins a minute. So one coin every two seconds. So that meant that whoever was operating the, the machine, putting those planches in, had to have really good rhythm and timing. They often used to use teenagers because of their smaller fingers and their quick reflexes. But yes, if you weren't quick, you could lose fingers. And in the United States, uh, we started using machines, uh, screw presses like that with add-on parts that allowed for automatic feeding and removal of the finished coins so that people didn't actually have to stick their fingers in anymore. It became a lot safer. Thank you for the comment. Yeah, we, we love to have people here and, and we, we everybody seems to have fun when they come here. So hopefully more of you will be able to make it at some point, especially as things start to open up after all this, this uh, you know, this pandemic. So keep our fingers crossed. Did they use Parmesan? I'm not sure what you mean by Parmesan. Do you mean Parmesan cheese? Uh, if so, not likely. I mean, Parmesan actually lasts for a long time, but it's, it's also, it, it can go bad and it's, it's not ideal for trade. Its value is relatively low. So it, not that I'm aware of. Coming up about Coin Week, the National Coin Day. Well, we, we have National Coin Week every year. It's in, uh, it's late April or, well, it's, it's, in, it's in April. And basically that's one of the things you can find on our, our website. Uh, we actually have information about it right now because we are going through the process of uh, developing uh, the questions and other things that people can compete in to win prizes right now. During the week, we will have events here at the museum. And actually this year, especially, we'll mostly have them online and people are welcome to come check the money.org website. So you'll see what's available. Uh, we, we usually have a special day on the Saturday of National Coin Week at the museum. Hopefully we'll be able to do that this year, but it's, you know, until we know more about the pandemic, uh, we're on hold for that. What is the oldest piece of money in the museum? Well, the oldest piece of money as we know it, as in coinage, uh, we have coins from Lydia. So we have coins that date back to about the 680s uh, BC. So we have coins going back to the very earliest days of when coins were produced. If you're talking about the old, oldest piece of something that could have been used as money, that's a little tougher to say. Most of the, the things that we have in the early money section that we showed, uh, you know, the whale tooth and other things like that, most of those are fairly modern because a lot of them were actually being used as, as little as 100 years ago or in some cases cowrie shells were still being used in the 1960s in places like East Africa and other areas. Um, but we do have some items that are very old as in, uh, let's see, some of these things. Well, the flint blank, we, we don't really have a date for that. That, that could be as old as uh, 12 or 1400 years old. Uh, there are other things that, well, that's that's about it. I, I don't really have a date for any of the other things because most of them 
don't actually come with a date on them. And unless we actually found them in a site that was clearly dated, we wouldn't be able to tell you. Did they use horns for train for trade? Absolutely. It depends. Not not your um, average uh, bullhorn or something like that, though. They, they could be used a little bit if they were if they were decorated. But today you have, and this is unfortunate. Rhin rhinoceros horns have been used for more than a thousand years, and now it's illegal to use them. But they are used as as a form of trade good, and they represent quite a bit of value. Uh, today, of course, since rhinoceros, rhinoceri are very rare, it's, it's unfortunate, but they still do that. Were dogs used for trade? Uh, not formally, not in the sense of a regular thing. I mean, people did trade dogs, but I'm not aware of, of dogs being given a standard value so that you would say one dog is worth X amount of cows or something like that, uh, in part because you know, dogs have been bred so much by people that all different sizes, even, you know, even 2000 years ago in Mexico, you had Chihuahua sized dogs. And then you had dogs that were more like a, uh, you know, a, a standard poodle in size. So it makes it harder. Dogs have always had a different relationship with people as well. People have used them as working animals, but there's always been a close personal relationship with dogs. That's why we, we name them and we let them sleep in the, home with us and things like that often. Okay, I think uh, at this point, I think we're done. I hope everybody enjoyed themselves and I hope you get a chance to visit our website and eventually I hope you get to come down and visit us here. We, we'd love to have you. We have a lot of great things to show. We have things like the King of American Coins, the most famous of the collector coins on display. And we have a lot of stories that go with them, which is what really makes money a lot of fun to study.